You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year ten. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the twenty-third to the twenty-sixth, if I'm not mistaken. Ah,、uh, actually, I think it's the twenty-fourth to the twenty-seventh. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So, well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and is that the campsite in the Lake District? No, actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid five pounds a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid ten pounds for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only four pounds per night, and they told me that if we had over fifty children, which we do, they could give us a further ten percent off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. Okay. So now these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes. Go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around seven on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At eight, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare, and that children love. Yes. Then. Lights out would be at nine thirty, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at seven on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at seven thirty, an hour's hiking from eight till nine, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to eleven. 
I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at twelve, and then sports in the afternoon till four. Another swim until five, and then supper. After clean-up, around six-thirty, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at eight, back to the tents at nine-thirty, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six, and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie. And it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between two women about the health system in England. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Hello, Mrs. Sutton. Come in. How are you settling in next door? Have all your things from Canada arrived yet? I thought I saw a removals van outside your house yesterday afternoon. Yes, they came yesterday. We spent all day yesterday arranging them. It's beginning to feel a bit more like home now. Oh, that's good. Look, come in and sit down. Are you all right? You look a bit worried. Well, I am a bit. I'm sorry to bother you so early, Mrs. Smith, but I wonder if you could help me. Could you tell me how I can get hold of a doctor? Our daughter Anna isn't very well this morning, and I may have to call somebody out. She keeps being sick, and I am beginning to get a bit worried. I just don't know how the health system works here in England. All I know is that it's very different from ours back in Canada. Well, I don't know really where to start. Let me think. Well, 
The first thing you have to do is find a family doctor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we call them general practitioners as well. Right. And register with him or her. If you live here, you've got to be on a doctor's list. If you're not, things can be a bit difficult.、Mm. Nobody will come out to you if you're not registered. Anyway, the working things called practices.、Uh -huh. Sort of small groups of family doctors all working together in the same buildings. Now, what you've got to do this morning is register with one of them.、Oh. There are two practices near here, so we're quite well off for doctors in this part of Manchester. There's the Dean End Health Centre, about ten、mm, minutes walk away, and there's another practice in South Hay. That's about five minutes away, going towards the town centre.、Uh -huh. We are registered at the Dean End one, but they're both okay. There are about six doctors in our practice and four in the other, so ours is quite big in comparison, and the building and everything's a bit more modern. South A is a bit old-fashioned, but the doctors are okay. Their only problem is that they don't have a proper appointment system. Sometimes you have to wait for ages there to see someone.、Mm. Anyway, you go to the receptionist in whichever health centre and ask her to register you with a doctor there. You have to fill in a form, but it doesn't take long. Ours is called Doctor Jones, and we've been going to him for years. Ever since we moved here fifteen years ago, I wouldn't say he's brilliant, but、um, I suppose he's all right. Really, we're used to him now. <laughs> They say he's very good with elderly people, but he does tend to get a bit impatient with children. Listen, the one who's supposed to be really good with small children is Doctor Shaw.、Ah. I've heard lots of people say that、mm -hmm. she's young and she's got small children of her own, so you could try registering with her. And if her list's full, I heard somebody say the other day that there's a really nice young doctor at South Hay, a Doctor Williams.、Mm -hmm. He holds special clinics for people with back trouble, but、uh, that's not really your problem, is it? <laughs> Now you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation, and answer questions eighteen to twenty. If you want a doctor to visit you at home, you have to ask for a home visit. You're supposed to do that before ten thirty in the morning, but obviously, if it's an emergency, you can phone at any time, night or day. It might not be your doctor that comes, though. It's quite often one of the other doctors in the practice. It doesn't really seem to make much difference.、Aye. Otherwise, you make an appointment to see your doctor at the health centre. You usually get seen the same day, not always, of course, but usually, as I say. The whole surgery is between nine and eleven thirty every weekday, and from four to six thirty Monday to Thursday. Saturdays are only for emergencies. I see. When the doctor sees you, he gives you a prescription. He writes what medication you need on it, and you take it to a chemist shop. There's one opposite the centre. If it's for a child under sixteen, you don't have to pay. So if it's for Anna, there's no problem. The same thing goes if you're unemployed or retired, or if you're pregnant. Just as well because it's not cheap. You pay the same price for each item the doctor has prescribed. At the moment, it's something like five pound per item. So you pay for the medication, but the consultation with the doctor doesn't cost you anything. It's completely free as long as you're a resident here.、Mm -hmm. You're going to be here for three years, aren't you? Uh huh. So, well, there shouldn't be any question of you paying anything to see the doctor.、Mm. 
So that's one less problem to worry about. <laughs> Look, Mrs Sutton, if you want, I'll sit with your daughter for half an hour if you want to go down to the health centre to register. It's no trouble, really. Don't worry. Are you sure you wouldn't mind? That would really help me a lot. I'll ask them if they can send someone round later to see Anna. I, I think I'll try the Dean End Centre. Good idea. Don't worry about Anna. Right. I'll be back as soon as I can. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Dr Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically... What makes successful people? Let's call them top achievers successful. Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me, then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it. But it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax could leave their work at the office, prize close friends and family life, and spend a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important though, Amanda. Yes, I agree, but being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two-thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer and only one-third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Actually, in the end, they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. 
Yes, Jake. That certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hard working people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something. She still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well. Top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I. Or we came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals, and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes, loners who are often over concerned about rivals can't delegate important work or decision making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job, and learned something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk from a series of lectures on the survival of our planet. Professor Samson talks about endangered species of flora and fauna. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully to the talk, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
Today's topic in this series of lectures on our planet is about ensuring the survival of our very important plant and animal species. In this lecture, I want to discuss one way that we can do this. No one will ever see a huge dinosaur thundering through the forest. No one will ever see a paradise parrot flash its rainbow colours across the sky. The fact is that many animals and plants have been wiped out. Sadly, they are extinct. It is too late for them. Extinction is forever. We can't do anything about the species that have already disappeared. But today, there are many animals and plants that could still become extinct in the future if we do not act now. They are endangered. The African elephant and rhinoceros have become endangered because of the value of their tusks. Australian parrots and reptiles are smuggled onto planes because certain people in other countries are prepared to pay thousands of dollars for them. And there are many other species around the world that are endangered because they no longer have a place in which to live and reproduce safely. The main cause of extinction is the destruction of habitats. A habitat contains all that a living thing needs to survive. Space, light, water, food, shelter and opportunities for reproduction. The population of the world is growing rapidly and this is placing great demands on land and resources for housing and for growing food. When vegetation is cleared and swamps are drained for agriculture, mining and suburbs, or when rivers are dammed to store water, plants are destroyed and animal life is threatened. In other words, humans are changing and destroying the habitats of animals and plants, which is in turn reducing their chances of survival. So how can we conserve habitats and help save endangered species? Well, one way is to protect their habitats permanently in national parks or nature reserves. National parks have been created in many countries. They encourage people to enjoy the beauty and diversity of the animals and plants that live there without harming them. By supporting and visiting these parks, people can become more aware of the species that live there and how the parks work to protect them. It is very important that, when visiting a national park, we keep them safe for future generations of plants and animals by obeying a few rules. Firstly, follow the fire regulations. Don't throw cigarettes or build fires, except at certain times of the year in especially allocated areas and facilities. Secondly, remember to leave pets at home. Pets, such as cats or dogs, can hunt birds or other small animals. Some pets might even escape and become a serious threat. Thirdly, place all rubbish in a bin or take it home. Plastic bags or leftover food are dangerous to the animals and harm the environment. Don't pick the flowers or damage the plants. Flowers create the next generation of the plant. Also, for the same reason, birds' eggs must be left in their nests. The loss of species in the past is sad. However, there is hope for the future. Despite the demands of our increasing population, we can work to protect the plant and animal species we still have. So I would like to conclude by saying that I believe that, with strong public awareness and support of these national parks and reserves, the future of endangered species can be ensured. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.